continued support. If this is your first time, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tim O'Sullivan. I'm an assistant professor of immunology at UCLA. The purpose of this seminar series is to increase the exposure of early career faculty at a time when we have not achieved equity and representation at scientific conferences and seminars despite equally innovative discoveries. We're excited to have Jared Dudikoff here with us today to support. Jared this did his, time, oh, let me mute myself. That. My name's okay. Jared did his PhD in the Boyd Lab at Monash University in Australia. There he developed extensive expertise in steady state immune function degeneration of the thymus. Jared's postdoctoral work was carried out with Marcel Vandenbrink at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And his work there focused on understanding the processes underlying the natural repair of the thymus after acute damage, um, such as radiation. So this work, was the first to reveal a comprehensive pathway of endogenous thymic regeneration, which centered on innate lymphoid cells, near and dear to my heart, and their production of interleukin-22. Uh, now as an independent investigator at Fred Hutch, his work continues to focus on understanding the mechanisms underlying endogenous thymic and hematopoietic stem cell regeneration and the role of cell death in aspects of this repair process. I just wanna remind everyone in the audience, if you have any questions for Jared during his talk, go ahead and type them into the chat box on the right. And I will ask these questions at the end of the talk. Jared, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, Justin. And uh, thanks for organizing this. this. is a really wonderful series. And as you mentioned, I think for, for people of our career stage, I think this is a, a really well-needed sort of thing. So today, as Tim said, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we've been working on, particularly around this sort of natural repair mechanisms in the thymus and, and what are the sort of mechanisms that actually orchestrate that process. And more importantly, how we can actually target them therapeutically and, and why that's important. So starting way at the beginning, though, why we're interested in this is because we objectively think T cells are the most interesting immune cell. And really, that is because of this interaction between the T cell receptor uh, and MHC and, and the fact that the T cell receptor can actually recognize unknown antigens through this uh, kind of random recombination. Now, unlike every other hematopoietic cell, which can develop both in the bone marrow and really just with a bit of a sprinkling of cytokines, T cells require this really specialized organ, so called the thymus. And this is twofold. One, it needs to expand and actually generate this diverse repertoire of T cell receptors. And it's been estimated to be somewhere in the order of about 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 33 possible T cell receptors. Now, to put that in context, there are about 10 to the 18 grains of sand on planet Earth. So huge repertoire diversity uh, possible within the TCR. But the problem is most of the proteins that we'll encounter, most of the peptides that we'll encounter are our own, are self-peptides. So the second role of the thymus, and probably possibly its most important role, is to educate those T cells, so to create tolerant T cells against self-peptides. And this balance, this diversity, uh, while being self-tolerant, uh, enables the recognition of unknown pathogens, unknown antigens, and even cancer immunosurveillance. So <clears throat> this is kind of the lineage relationship of what goes on during hematopoiesis to get from a hematopoietic stem cell through to a naive T cell, going through all of these stepwise uh, processes through the commitment down the T cell lineage, the expansion in the number of cells, uh, uh, recombination of the T cell receptor, uh, and then these kind of education events. But the thing is, it's really not so linear. And in fact, it's a very complicated process. As I mentioned, it requires this specialized organ. And the reason that is, is because it requires these specialized cells to actually guide that process. So here are these same stages of T cell development going from you know, a circulating T lineage progenitor that comes in from the blood uh, and then goes through these stepwise stages, all really in close interaction with the stromal microenvironment. And that's comprised of cells like the epithelial cells, these TEX, thymic epithelial cells that can be uh, distinguished either by the, uh, their location in the cortex or the medulla. These are the cells that really drive T cell development. They provide the signals uh, and really mediate that education uh, against uh, our own peptides. But other cells are also involved, things like fibroblasts and macrophages, dendritic cells. We've become particularly interested in endothelial cells as well, all comprising the thymic microenvironment, all creating this very complex uh, network of cells that enables the development and differentiation of T cells. But the problem is thymic function and T cell development is not a static process. And in fact, over time, it's probably one of the more sensitive organs to age. And so you can see thymic function declining over time uh, uh, throughout lifespan. And so here you can just see uh, histology images of human thymus, 
uh, across lifespan. And you can see even in very young ages in, in kind of pediatric patients, you can start to see a loss of thymic function. So starting to get perivascular spaces and infiltration of, oh, excuse me, uh, infiltration of fatty tissue such that, you know, in an old elderly, uh, elderly person, there's very little functional tissue left. And so if you look at the output of T cells, and so over here, we're looking at something called T cell receptor excision circles. This is a way we can measure uh, recent thymic emigrants, those cells that have recently come out of the thymus uh, in humans. And you can see that over time, there is just this gradual decline in uh, the number of cells uh, coming out of the thymus. Oops, excuse me. So what does this actually mean? So in a normal young uh, thymus, you've got a bunch of cells coming out, a bunch of naive cells coming out, and so you've got this very broad repertoire of T cells. Uh, what happens though in an elderly, uh, elderly person though, is you actually get an expansion of memory cells as fewer na naive T cells are coming out. And so what this is gonna do is start to constrict that T cell receptor repertoire. So you've got fewer, uh, uh, less breadth in that receptor diversity. Now we think this has several different clinical, uh, clinical uh, problems. The first of which is in vaccination where a very well-known phenomenon being elderly patients are far less receptive to uh, vaccinations. We think one of the reasons this is is because you get this loss of uh, T cell function with age, a loss of the output of new naive T cells. Uh, and similarly, if you look at the response to checkpoint inhibition, which is you know, phenomenally successful uh, uh, cancer immunotherapy, there is this very clear correlation between the response to checkpoint inhibition and the mutational burden of the tumor itself. And so what this says to us is both of these immunotherapies are predicated on the fact that there is a T cell clone there to recognize that tumor neoantigen or that vaccine antigen. So in the case of checkpoint inhibition, if there are more mutations, if there are more neoantigens, the probability of having that clone there uh, is increased. But we would say there's kind of a second rheostat there to say that the receptor diversity itself also would contribute to that probability of success. So if you had a higher, a broader repertoire of T cells, you'd have a greater chance of having a clone there to recognize that tumor. In an elderly patient where you've got fewer T cells out there, fewer naive T cells, that probability goes down. The second problem is the thymus is really sensitive to acute damage. Uh, and you can see this here, this is in four different models of, of uh, damage to the thymus in the mouse. Uh, cyclophosphamide is a model of chemotherapy, uh, dexamethasone as a corticosteroid stress, uh, TBI, total body irradiation. This is kind of our bread and butter model that I'll go through you know, much, in, uh, much in the talk. Uh, and LPS is a model of bacterial infection or sepsis, all of which leads to this profound loss of thymic cellularity in the very early stages after these treatments. But the thing is, it also has this pretty remarkable capacity to repair itself. And so you can see this here in the mouse model of chemotherapy. This is giving cyclophosphamide to mice, uh, where you can see this rapid loss of cellularity, but it sort of comes back pretty quickly. And in fact, you can see a similar thing in the human. This is some old data from Crystal McCall, where you can see this loss of uh, circulating CD4 T cells after two rounds of chemotherapy, and then they sort of come back. But the problem is, when you start to put those two things together, an aging thymus, loss of functional tissue with age, uh, and acute damage, it can take a profoundly long time to actually recover those T cells. And so in the mouse model of chemotherapy here, uh, you can see it takes a lot longer to come back. Uh, and in the human setting, this patient, even after almost two years, still had not recovered their CD4 counts uh, to pre chemotherapy levels. And it's worth noting that this particular patient was a 23 year old. So no one's real definition of an elderly person and they still struggled to recover their T cells. And it's important noting that the underlying mechanisms that actually uh, drive this endogenous tissue regeneration are really quite poorly understood. Even though we've actually known that the thymus can repair itself even longer than we've known the immunological role of the thymus. Now this can have really uh, uh, profound implications, particularly in bone marrow transplant. Because one of the things you need to do for a successful transplant is myeloablation. You need to clear out the immune system and then it can take a long time to recover, particularly T cells. So unlike things like neutrophils and B cells, which come back pretty quickly, T cells can take years, if ever, to come back. And if you look at what will actually kill patients after bone marrow transplant, this is in the allogeneic setting, 
it's things like primary relapse, graft versus host disease and infection, all three of which we think can impact, be impacted by mm. thymic function. And in fact, some beautiful work done by Antoine Toubert a few years ago in Paris showed that if you measure thymic function before transplant, and this is using these treks that I mentioned before, so this is measuring recent thymic emigrants, what you can see is that if the patients had high level of treks before transplant, they had a much better overall survival rate after transplant. So thymic function or constitution of T cells is really important. So there's clearly a need for therapies that can actually boost thymic function. And we're thinking about this in two different fashions. One is this acute damage setting where uh, there's a profound loss of T cells and it takes a long time to recover. Really, it's a numbers game over there. We need to uh, uh, promote the development of new T cells. Uh, and then in the chronic insult fashion, particularly age, but also chronic infection, where there's this gradual loss of cells and a loss of that diversity in the repertoire, we think we need to, again, stimulate new T cell development and that by boosting the repertoire, we can actually have uh, impacts on clinical outcomes. Now, our main premise is that by understanding the mechanisms that actually govern the endogenous repair of the thymus, we can generate new therapies to boost thymic function. So the last few years, we've outlined uh, a couple of different uh, pathways that seem to underlie endogenous thymic repair. So as Tim mentioned, the first of these was based on interleukin-22 production by innate lymphoid cells. And so in this pathway, damage to the thymus uh, stimulates dendritic cells to produce interleukin-23, uh, and then that stimulates IL seeds to produce interleukin-22. Uh, and then they stimulate the thymic epithelial cells, those stromal cells, uh, and that mediates repair. And then a couple of years ago, we, we outlined a second pathway. Again, this one, uh, uh, sorry, mediated by endothelial cells. Again, thymic damage stimulating their production of BMP4 this time. Uh, that again stimulated thymic epithelial cells. Uh, we know a little bit more about what happens downstream there. It activates FOXM1 and delta like 4 uh, But either way, it leads to the same reparative um, repair. So one of the questions we've been interested in the last couple of years is, is there a common mechanism that actually, common mechanism that triggers this uh, tissue regeneration from these distinct pathways? And so a very talented uh, postdoc and then staff scientist, Sinead Kinsella was working on this uh, and has come up with some really fascinating findings. So looking at the older data based on the BMP4 and IL-22 pathways, something was quite striking to us. So first of all, they follow a very similar path. So if we're looking at the levels of IL-22 or BMP4 after damage, they both go up pretty quickly and then sort of come back down. And this really reflects in an inverse fashion, thymic cellularity itself, which goes down pretty quickly and then sort of starts to come back up. So there was this inverse correlation between thymic cellularity, thymic size, and the production of these factors. And in fact, in the IL-22 story, a really interesting phenomenon uh, uh, we observed where if we took mice with different uh, genetic ablations in different stages of T-cell development, we could see a really profound effect on the production of these reparative cytokines. Namely, if we took uh, any knockout that basically had a block before double positive, so this is the most numerous cell in the thymus, this is at the stage where they're starting to educate those T-cell receptors, uh, we saw this really large increase in IL-23 and IL-22. So this was in IL-7 knockouts or IL-7 receptor knockouts, RAG knockouts or TCR beta knockouts, all have significantly larger amounts of IL-23 and IL-22. But in mice that either had a block in single positives or, or a bit of a, um, a, a dysfunction of medullary epithelial cells, we really didn't see any effect on the production of these cytokines. And it's really worth noting that this is in a non damage setting. So just taking these mice themselves have a, a considerably larger amounts of these cytokines, even though their thymuses themselves are really, really small. So we started thinking about, well, what might be going on? Could the double positives actually be suppressing the production of these reparative factors? But when you actually remove those double positives, you start to release that handbrake. And so we're wondering, well, what could double positives be doing to actually mediate this suppressive effect? And we started thinking, well, what are double positives actually good at? And that is they're really good at dying. And so this is like a classic um, Janeway kind of figure here. This is the, the sort of hierarchy of positive selection. So when the double positives start to express a functional T cell receptor, they start to engage MHC on these cortical epithelial cells. And then if the signal is too weak or not at all, they die and they, they die primarily by death by neglect. 
or if the signal is too strong, they also die or they get routed through a, a regulatory T cell phenotype. And it's only this little Goldilocks zone in the middle that actually get through and survive. And it's only a very, very few number of cells, very few proportional number of cells that actually get through this stage. So most of the double positives are actually killed off at this point. So we're wondering whether apoptosis itself could actually be suppressive to the production of these reparative factors. So we turn to a system that we've developed in the lab, and this was in collaboration with Shaheen Rafi, where what he was able to do was to um, transduce endothelial cells from different tissues with this adenoviral gene, and it basically enables you to start propagating and, and uh, manipulating these cells ex vivo. And so if we took these thymic endothelial cells that have been uh, uh, done with this antiviral gene or freshly isolated dendritic cells and either incubated them with thymocytes that had been induced to undergo apoptosis with a corticosteroid dexamethasone or inhibited that apoptosis with the pan-caspase uh, inhibitor ZVAD FMK, in both instances, we saw an increase in their production of reparative factors. So in dendritic cells, we saw an increase in IL-23. In endothelial cells, we uh, saw an increase in BMP4. And these are these two key factors in that reparative process. So how are apoptotic cells detected? And that is, there's several different ways. One of the more prominent of these are uh, via these receptors called TAM receptors, and that's via their names, either tyro, axle, or mer. And what they do is they bind uh, phosphatidyl serine, which is inverted from the inner cell membrane to the outer cell membrane in one of the earliest events uh, during apoptosis. And via these intermediaries, either GAS6 or PROS1, uh, the TAM receptors can actually uh, binds to the PS uh, and then mediate either phagocytosis or some sort of activation. And this is often mediated downstream by these rho GTPases. This can, can occur in all sorts of different cells, hematopoietic and endothelial, epithelial, mesenchymal, it's sort of across the board sort of used, used as a, as a mechan mechanism of detecting apoptotic cells. So if we look at the amount of, uh, or just the binding of phosphatidyl serine uh, using an Exon5, even though we actually see this really large increase in the amount of an exon 5 binding to double positive cells after damage, um, so this is in the early stages of after total body irradiation, what we actually see is this complete loss of these double positive thymocytes. And so really what results is that if we look at the total amount of an exon 5 bindings, so this is across the entire tissue itself, we see this significant decline in the amount of an exon 5 binding. So the amount of available phosphatidyl serine goes down after damage, consistent with this hypothesis that that detection of PS is suppressing the production of these reparative factors. And you can see this pretty tight correlation here between the number of cells in the thymus uh, and the amount of an exon 5 binding, perhaps not surprisingly. So we wanted to know if we could actually block this particular interaction between the TAM receptors and the apoptotic thymocytes and whether that would mediate the same effect as inhibiting apoptosis itself. So we took a very similar assay to what I described before, where we take thymocytes out, uh, incubate them with dexamethasone to induce uh, apoptosis, uh, and then co-culture those cells with either dendritic cells or thymic endothelial cells, uh, and look at the expression of either IL-23 or BMP4. Uh, and in this case, what we were doing, rather than inhibiting apoptosis, we were actually inhibiting the apoptosis detection via blocking these TAM receptors with a pan-TAM inhibitor called RXDX106. And much the same as when we blocked apoptosis, if we block the interaction of these apoptotic cells with uh, either dendritic cells or endothelial cells, we see this induction in the production of IL-23 or BMP4. So really suggestive that this relationship, this detection of apoptotic cells uh, is suppressive to the production of these reparative factors. So as I mentioned, one of the, one of the downstream effects of this is via activation of these rho GTPases. And typically this is uh, to mediate cytoskeletal rearrangements, particularly for things like phagocytosis. So we were curious whether in this particular system, uh, we were actually getting activation of RAC1 in particular, and this will become apparent in a moment why. And basically, so using a very similar system, this case uh, using dexamethasone to induce the apoptosis and either ZVAD or uh, RXDX, so either blocking apoptosis itself uh, or blocking the detection of apoptosis. In both instances, we saw a reduction in the activation of RAC1. So 
suggesting that this is the pathway that seems to be getting activated, or at least one pathway that's being activated after, um, after uh, detection of these apoptotic thymocytes. So we wanted to see whether we, if we could actually block uh, these rho GTPases to see if that could actually enhance the production of these reparative factors. So we took endothelial cells or dendritic cells and incubated them with a, 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 um, a, a panel of different inhibitors for various rho GTPases. Uh, and in fact, we see this increased production of BMP4 uh, as well as the uh, one of the subunits for, units for IL-23 when we block rho A, uh, ROC, which is actually downstream of rho A or RAC1, uh, we don't really see any effect if we block CDC42, another family member. So this all consistent that detection of apoptotic thymocytes uh, leading to this induction of uh, rho GTPases uh, is actually suppressive to the production of these factors. And in fact, if we take a RAC1 flox mouse and cross it with a, a dendritic cell specific CRE, so CD11C CRE in this case, uh, and we irradiate these mice to see whether there might be an improvement in thymic repair, we actually do see this increase in thymic function uh, early after damage. So it really suggests that if we actually block this pathway, we can improve thymic function after acute damage. Now, this was really exciting to us when we started finding these rho GTPase findings, because <clears throat> in a whole other side of the story that I'm not really, don't have a lot of time to go into to today, but it is, has just been published in the last couple of months, is we were starting to work on NOD2 and how this might be suppressive to uh, the production of these factors. And this was based on a, a beautiful paper a few years ago by Alison Simmons group at Oxford, showing that NOD2 can actually limit the release of IL-23 at the resolution of, of inflammation. And so one of the things, early things we did was take uh, mice that were deficient for NOD2 uh, and looked at their production of BMP4 and IL-23 after damage. Uh, and we see this significant induction of these cytokines. Uh, and uh, similarly, we see this uh, significant induction in thymic cellularity uh, when we damage those mice. And the reason this was really exciting to us is because we were starting to look, well, NOD2 is typically a sensor of bacterial, uh, um, bacterial ligand, so peptidoglycans in the bacterial cell wall. We didn't really think that was going to be the ligand that was in the thymus. We were starting to think about what, was, what were non-bacterial ligands for NOD2, and one of the ones that was popping up was ro these rho GTPases. So there's been more and more evidence recently that NOD2 can actually act as a sensor for activated rho GTPases. And so this would sit with our um, hypothesis of, of uh, sorry, this pathway. So what we actually think is going on is that during steady state, when there's a lot of thymocyte apoptosis due to positive selection, there is this activation of this pathway via detection of uh, phosphatidylserine by these TAM receptors. We think there's activation of RAC1 in particular, but other rho GTPases as well. Uh, we think this is mediated by NOD2 or sensed by NOD2. Uh, and then in data I haven't shown today, we think this activates this MIR-29C to inhibit the production of those reparative factors. But after damage, when there is a loss of those thymocytes, those thymocytes completely depleted out, now you don't get detection of those cells, you don't get activation of this downstream pathway, uh, and you get this release of cytokines. So we're kind of thinking about this as a bit of a dead man switch. It's a really innate process. So just getting rid of those cells themselves is, innate, is enough to actually trigger this reparative process. So obviously we were thinking, well, can we actually translate this into a therapeutic strategy to boost thymic function? So we have a, a bunch of inhibitors that we've been working with in vitro, and we can actually stimulate uh, production of these reparative factors in vitro. So we wanted to see whether we could actually put those in mice. So we took this one particular uh, RAC1 inhibitor called EHT1864, uh, and we irradiated mice and then gave it a, a couple of different time points afterwards and looked at thymic cellularity. And we see this significant induction of thymic cellularity afterwards. Uh, we do see an induction of IL-23 and BMP4. Uh, and importantly, it seems to be also leading towards an export of naive T cells uh, out into the periphery as well. So we're now working on uh, whether we can use this in the age setting and how we can actually improve this to, to improve uh, our T cell reconstitution, particularly uh, in bone marrow transplant models. But the thing is, what you might ask is, so even though thym uh, apoptosis of thymocytes might be suppressive to the production of these reparative factors, you might ask, well, after damage, there's clearly going to be a lot of cell death. And you can see that. I mean, if you look at the amount of cells just in the, in the thymus early after damage, there is this profound loss 
uh, this is as a, as a proportion. So there's clearly a, a, a huge loss. There is a huge amount of cell death going on after damage. So we started wondering about other forms of cell death and what might be happening. So apoptosis, which is generally thought to be immunologically silent, um, <clears throat> seems to be suppressive to the production of these factors via this pathway I just outlined. But the thing is, there is some evidence that things like ionizing radiation can actually lead to immunogenic cell death. So a lytic form of cell death where there's a release of things like dams uh, that can actually initiate an immune response. So we're really curious to see whether there might be a switch towards immunogenic cell death after damage. So we started looking at the activation of caspase 1, which is used during pyroptosis, a form of lytic, form of, uh, form of lytic cell death. And we actually see this significant induction in caspase 1 activation uh, early after damage. And while we do see an increase in caspase 3, suggesting there is also an increase in apoptosis, the difference between their uh, uh, increases after damage is quite profound. So there really does seem to be a switch uh, towards immunogenic cell death and, and probably pyroptosis after, after damage. And if we look at some of the hallmarks of immunogenic cell death, we, we do see an induction of those. So we see a release of lactate dehydrogenase into the uh, extracellular milieu. Uh, and we also see this activation of gas derm and D, particularly within the CD45 fraction of thymocytes. So really suggesting that there is this induction of immunogenic cell death after, after damage. So we wanted to know, well, given that apoptosis is suppressive to the production of these factors, we want to know well, whether lytic cell death and, and pyroptosis in particular could be pro-regenerative. So um, we took that same sort of models I described before, only this time what we were doing was to induce either necrosis or pyroptosis. We've got a couple of different models here of, of inducing a lytic form of cell death uh, and incubating those cells either on dendritic cells uh, endothelial cells, or I've actually got epithelial cells here too. And in all three instances, whether we're inducing uh, cell death, but inhibiting caspase mediated form of cell death, uh, so this would be more of a necrosis, we get an induction of IL-23. Uh, if we take cells just directly out of the thymus uh, 48 hours after radiation, and then incubate those cells with endothelial cells, so again, this would be uh, our hypothesis being that there is more immunogenic cell death at that point, uh, we see this induction of BMP4. Uh, and then this is particularly interesting, and, and I'm not going to go into it anymore today, but this is a, a strong part of research for the lab at the moment, is that uh, if we incubate pyroptotic thymocytes, this is uh, induced by it with negerison, we can actually get an induction of FOXN1 within thymic epithelial cells. And FOXN1 is kind of a key thymic epithelial cell transcription factor involved in their uh, development and maintenance and even regeneration as well. So we're really curious as to what the signal could actually be that's coming from these dying thymocytes that triggers the regenerative response. So what is that damp that seems to be uh, initiating this, this process? And so <clears throat> this, uh, at the same time, we were working on uh, the role of zinc in T cell development. And one of the findings that actually came out of that was that after damage, there is a really strong induction, uh, translocation of zinc from the inside of cells to the outside of cells. So zinc seems to accumulate with thymocytes as they develop, as they differentiate and develop. But then after damage in the early time points after total body irradiation, there is this release of zinc into the extracellular milieu. So we're curious as to whether zinc could be playing a role here in uh, stimulating a, a reparative effect. So we took uh, our in vitro models here where we've got endothelial cells on dendritic cells, and this time we incubated them with uh, zinc sulfate. And we looked at the production of either BMP4 or IL-23. And in both instances, we saw that zinc itself could directly induce BMP4 by endothelial cells uh, and IL-23 by dendritic cells. Uh, we've got far less work on the, uh, on the dendritic cell side, but I'll now go into a lot of detail with the endothelial cells in the BMP4, but we do think it seems to actually directly induce the production of these reparative factors. Now, importantly, what we can actually do here is we can actually give zinc to mice and zinc supplements are taken, you know, all the time. So we wanted to know whether if we could give a large dose of zinc to mice and see an effect on thymic function. And so this is in a model of bone marrow transplant. So taking... Um, uh, uh, female B6 uh, bone marrow and putting it into male B6 mice. It's a minor mismatch transplant, not a, um, 
uh, uh, MHC match minor mismatch transplant. And the way we're doing this is we're starting zinc supplementation. We put it into their drinking water and we start this three weeks before transplant. Uh, they get radiation and then a transplant is A0 and then we're measuring afterwards. And in this system, whenever we're looking after transplant, we see this really large increase in thymic cellularity in the mice that have supplemented zinc. Now, importantly, when we perform this same transplant on, instead of using B6 uh, bone marrow, we use RAG2 GFP bone marrow. And what this does is it enables us to track recent thymic emigrants that have actually coming out of the thymus. Um, we think, um, <clears throat> and so now if we're looking at GFP positive cells, these are cells that have recently expressed uh, 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 RAG, so they are cells that have recently come out. And so if we look in both CD4 cells or CD8 cells, we see this significant induction of, um, of uh, recent thymic emigrants in the mice that have been treated uh, with zinc. But the problem is, the way we think this is working is that, um, as I say, so zinc seems to be required for T cell development, particularly the transition from double negative thymocytes uh, to double positive thymocytes in that development and expansion of those cells. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and so what we think is going on is that when we give this three weeks beforehand, you get an accumulation of zinc within the thymocytes. And then when we come in with a hit of damage, we get immunogenic cell death uh, and we get a release of zinc that can then stimulate the endothelial cells and dendritic cells in particular uh, to release their reparative factors. But the problem is this requires this long lead time, this long uh, uh, pre-treatment of zinc to actually work. And so this is shown over here, where if we give zinc either starting at day zero or starting at day minus 21, we see, any, we see the induction, particularly when we give it three weeks before, we start to see a signal at day zero, uh, but it's much lower. And we think that the reason that is, is because really what's stimulating the reparative uh, response in this setting is just whatever free floating zinc is around based on the, on the uh, taken up from the drinking water. Whereas in the three week, uh, accumulated group, there's a lot more within those cells to then be released uh, and stimulate that reparative response. So <clears throat> we think that zinc itself could be a, 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 you know, an important way to stimulate thymic function, particularly in the transplant setting. But given this really complicated mechanism of the accumulation and then release, directly targeting what the zinc is actually doing to the endothelial cells and dendritic cells could be a far better uh, therapeutic strategy. So how does zinc uh, uh, mediate its effect on cells? So zinc can modulate its effect uh, via two different uh, routes. The first and probably most prominent are via these uh, ion channels, the zips and the zints. So the zips let zinc inside the cell from uh, the extracellular milieu. Uh, zints let zinc outside of the cell. Uh, and once zinc is inside the cell, it can interact with something like 300 odd proteins directly. Uh, so it can do a huge number of things. There is this second pathway though, a much more recently described pathway though, where there's this G protein coupled receptor, GPR39 on the cell surface. Uh, and this is a zinc sensing receptor. And so by sensing zinc from the uh, extracellular space, it can uh, lead to an intracellular signaling uh, uh, response. So we wanted to know well, what, which of these pathways could be uh, mediating this effect on the production of BMP4. And so we took that same assay. So here, what we're doing is we're taking endothelial cells, uh, we're stimulating them with zinc, uh, and then instead of, <clears throat> excuse me, we're stimulating with zinc plus or minus uh, a drug called zinc parathion. And so what this does is it leads to the uh, influx of zinc from the extracellular space. So now this is leading to any zinc that's out there in the, in the media is going to be getting inside the cell. And so in this system, if we just give zinc in the absence of pyrothion, we do see this induction of BMP4 as we've sort of shown before. But if we put it in the presence of zinc pyrothion, that doesn't, that basically takes away that effect. So this suggests to us that the zinc getting inside the cell is not the mechanism by which it seems to be stimulating BMP4 production at least. So this indirectly at least would suggest that stimulating the GPR39 receptor uh, we think is what might be mediating this effect. So if we look at, I'm not sure quite why that's so fuzzy. Uh, if we look at the expression of the uh, GPR39 respect, uh, receptor within the thymus, uh, we really just don't see any expression within the thymocytes. These are the developing DN thymocytes, uh, double positives and single positive thymocytes. 
Uh, really interestingly, we see very high expression within the epithelial cells, uh, and then pretty con uh, consistent expression within the endothelial cells and dendritic cells as well. Uh, but what's interesting, if we look after damage, um, perhaps not surprisingly, because they're already so high, there's not really a change in the expression of GPR39 within the epithelial cells, uh, but there seems to be this really strong induction of GPR39 within both the endothelial cells uh, and the dendritic cells, suggesting they might be using this as a, as a mechanism of which are uh, 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 responding to damage. So we wanted to know if we could actually um, inhibit that process and, and, and knock down that GPR39. So we took our endothelial cell system uh, and we knocked it down with a, an siRNA uh, and in, uh, induced BMP4 with uh, zinc sulfate. And so in the sort of scrambled setting, we see this increase in BMP4, uh, but if we actually silence BM, uh, sorry, GPR39 uh, and stimulate with zinc, we don't really see any effect of, uh, uh, of zinc itself. So this really strongly suggests to us that GPR39 is the, uh, is the target of zinc and that seems to be mediating this effect on, on thymic function. Uh, and so we wanted to know whether if we directly stimulate that GPR39 receptor, uh, whether that could actually induce this uh, uh, response. Uh, so we found a GPR39 agonist, this drug called TCG1008. Uh, and so we put it on our endothelial cells to look at its induction of BMP4. Uh, and we found that zinc, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, as, uh, as we've previously shown, zinc itself leads to this induction of BMP4. Interestingly, though, TCG leads to a considerably more induction of BMP4, uh, although there really wasn't any synergy between these two, uh, between these two uh, uh, together. So clearly we want to know whether this could actually work in mice, and this is all uh, uh, pretty recent data, including some that actually just came across my desk yesterday. Uh, and this is really, really exciting. So we can actually give this to mice. Uh, we do this via a guided feeding approach. So this is kind of an alternate uh, gavage approach where we kind of train them to take it up themselves. They kind of like to take it up because it's in uh, uh, condensed milk. And so we give this over a number of different days, uh, and then we're looking at thymic cellularity, and we see this considerable uh, induction, uh, considerable increase in thymic cellularity in an allogeneic transplant model uh, when we give this drug TCG1008. Uh, and we've looked a little bit later now, this is in a slightly different model where instead of a, a B6 into bal B, which is a MHC mismatched but minor uh, antigen mismatch transplant, uh, we used the RAG2 GFP mice uh, to see if we could track recent thymic emigrants and looked a little bit later uh, while we're redosing every every couple of days uh, in the later weeks. Uh, and we again see this in, increase in thymic cellularity even out to day 40 now. Uh, and really importantly, and this is this is really cool and, and why I wanted to put it in even I came across yesterday, is we do see this increase in recent thymic emigrants. So there is this in um, induction of thymic function and export of new naive T cells out of the periphery. And really that's what we want, particularly in the transplant setting, because as I mentioned at the start, it's that prolonged uh, uh, prolonged reconstitution of T cells that can be a real problem in, in the transplant setting. Um, <clears throat> but of course, we also wanna know whether this might work in a chronic injury setting. So we looked in aged mice with no damage. So now these are, um, these are male mice that are either two month old, so these are just normal aged mice, uh, or middle aged or old mice. And we give TCG1008, this GPR39 agonist, uh, and we see this increase in thymic cellularity pretty much at all of the time points we look at um, when we give this drug. So not only does it work in the acute damage setting where we can actually improve T cell reconstitution after transplant, uh, but it also seems to work in um, a chronic injury setting where there isn't that induction of immunogenic cell death. So directly stimulating that GPR39 agonist is enough to actually increase thymic cellularity. So we're really excited about these results and now taking them further and, and trying to, trying to uh, you know, translate them essentially. So what we have is <clears throat> um, we've got a balance between detection of cell death, as I say in the title. And so the first story suggests that apoptosis from positively selected thymocytes, or really just any, any cell death of, of thymocytes in the baseline, and their detection by these TAM receptor detecting phosphatidylserine 
activating row GTP ASES, uh, therefore activating NOD2 and, and downstream near 29 c This is suppressive to the production of these reparative factors, particularly IL-23 and BMP4, uh, and then indirectly via IL-22. But after damage, where there is this depletion of those thymocytes, those thymocytes are, are kind of you know, removed from the system, now you've got a release of that handbrake. And so now you get basically an abrogation of this pathway, uh, release of IL-23, BMP4, and then IL-22, acting on the thymic epithelial cells and then mediating repair. But then the flip side to that is to say that after damage, there's also this switch towards immunogenic cell death uh, and the release of, of damps, one of which we think is actually zinc. And so what zinc does is activating uh, this receptor GPR39 on dendritic cells and endothelial cells, possibly also TEX as well. And this is something we're exploring at the moment is what, what the direct effect is. Uh, but in the case of DCs and endothelial cells, at least, stimulating the production of IL-23 and BMP4, and again, stimulating that uh, thymic repair. And really, most importantly, though, these can all be targeted to therapeutically boost thymic function after acute, uh, but also possibly a chronic insult. And so now, really, we're working towards uh, fully defining that, so really interrogating different models of bone marrow transplant and age, uh, infection models. Uh, and we've also started also discussing with some um, pharmaceutical companies about actually trying to develop therapies based on these um, targets. And so with that, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone in my lab, particularly uh, Sinead Kinsella and Lorenzo Vino, who did uh, the work, Sinead, on the RoGTPases and some of the early work on the immunogenic cell death and kind of another side of that story. Uh, and Lorenzo Iavino, who's done all of the work on the zinc and is a really talented uh, um, uh, clinician in the lab, uh, as well as everyone else in the lab. So Kirsten, in particular, my lab manager, uh, and Cindy, who have done an enormous amount on these sort of projects, uh, our collaborators, people like Shaheen, Alex Gavon at uh, UW who helped with the mass spectrometry of the zinc uh, and Jeff uh, and Yanko for sort of T-cell models and things like that. And of course our, our funding. And so with that, just like to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. That was a fantastic talk. Um, we already have a couple of questions in the chat so I can go ahead and forward those to you. So uh, Eugenio is asking whether zinc can prevent thymic involution during aging. Yeah, so we think it can, well, okay. Um, zinc itself, if we supplement it, it can, just like when we give it at day zero, it can kind of do a little bit, but not a, not a huge amount, just because there's only so much that can actually go around. Where we think the zinc supplementation really works is when you can actually induce that immunogenic cell death uh, to release the accumulated zinc. Uh, that's why we're really interested in targeting the GPR39 receptor in particular and, and kind of in those last slides, I think we're, we're showing that we can actually um, reverse some effects of thymic involution. Now, whether zinc can prevent involution itself, that is if we start mice from very early on with a lot of zinc supplementation and, and kind of let them go, I think it's a really interesting question. I suspect it wouldn't stop it, but I suspect those mice would kind of always have baseline cellularity that was kind of above their above their age, age match cohort. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a really funny thing, thymic involution. One, we don't really understand exactly what's going on. And even though we can kind of reverse it in various situations, it doesn't seem to be able to be stopped very easily. Um, there are a few methods such as like FOXN1 induction and things like that, but it's very, very hard to, to sort of stop. So we are certainly looking at some of those things, but I, I think um, prevention might be harder than, than treatment. Okay, we have another question from Bella in the chat. She says, um, are necretic cells also display phosphocytocytosine? Do you think the zinc signal overrides the TAM receptor row signaling? Well, I think it comes down to, yeah, I think it's a really good question. And this is something I was uh, looking at the other day. I think part of the reason we actually see this massive induction of an XN5 binding after damage is because of that primarily. But even so, those cells are disappearing. And so I think there is still basically this loss of phosphatidylserine, even in those necrotic cells. Um, and so by, you know, day two, day three, where you've basically got, you know, 1% of the thymocytes that were there at, at day zero, uh, there really just isn't enough there, or it's, it is overcome by some of those sort of pro, pro signals. But I think this is where the kind of balance comes in. It's this sort of um, um, 
yes, there is still an excellent, so yes, there is probably a suppressive signal over here, uh, but it, it does get drowned out, I think, by, by some of these other sort of signals. But I think it's a really, really interesting point. Can I follow up on that real quick, oh, Tim? Ahead, yeah, yeah it, it's just, it's easier to articulate than to try and type in like 250. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm on the first part, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical that the notion that blocking PS signaling or blocking engulfment is actually going to be in any way long-term beneficial to the host. Um, so, you know, I wonder if you did that experiment, if you did that sort of more chronic blocking or genetic deletion versus, you know, the cleavage resistant MRTK, for instance, would you actually see this skewing towards fibrosis as opposed to actual regeneration? You know, I mean, when we talk regeneration, that's a bit of a, a qualitative distinction, not a necessarily quantitative one. And so I'm wondering if, if this is really going to be a beneficial thing to do. Yeah, um, I think it's a, it, it's a good point. Now, as to whether it would lead to fibrosis, I don't know, but I, I, I would always caution that this would be a kind of, um, there would be a window for this kind of thing, especially the rho GTPase inhibition. And that's, that's multiple fold. One, some of the reasons you mentioned, we know that it is involved in normal T cell development. And so I think having some of those there could actually be detrimental at a certain point. So I think the rho GTPase inhibition, I think is going to be particularly potentially useful in a transplant setting and in a very early stages where what you are actually trying to do where there are basically no T cells there, no thymocytes there, you want to stimulate the epithelial cells. You want to stimulate that stromal environment. Um, and so I think a short course in those kind of early points um, could stimulate that kind of function. Now, giving it long term, I don't know, I think that's a really interesting question. We've certainly thought about it. I suspect it would be detrimental, whether it's because of fibrosis, whether it's because it's inhibiting normal T cell development from the thymocyte side or both. It's, a, it's a, definitely a good question. So, yeah, like I say, I think it would be more of a sort of short course early on. Uh, not so much of a kind of chronic, uh, chronic thing. Whether that's going to work in the age setting as well, I think is is also an open question. We've started doing some of that work, but I think for some of those reasons, I think it might be um, might not be as as uh, um, you know showing enough potential. I suppose, but it's a good point. And I have a follow up kind of crazy question for you here. So um, I'm really interested in the um, fat formation in the thymus. And I'm sort of curious whether if you have repeated injury uh, events, are you more predisposed to then, you know, adipocyte deposition? Um, <clears throat> it's an excellent experiment. Hard one to model in mice because mice don't age in the same way that humans do. They, they, the, the, the tissue kind of gets smaller. It doesn't get as much fat. Although you do see some EMT-like um, um, sort of processes occurring. Um, I think the chronic or, or, or repeated damage is, that's an experiment I really want to do. Um, I, yeah, it's been on the mind for a while. I think it's a really, really good run. And, you know, do, does it come back fully each time? Do you lose it and things like that? I think it's a really interesting question. I think it's have a, a lot of implication for human biology where, I mean, I think we are continually involuting and, and repairing you know, over our lifespan because of, you know, infection, because of stress, because of, you know, all of these different, you know, minor insults. What we're talking about are these major acute, you know, damages, but, you know, we're all experiencing these things on a kind of daily basis. And so I, I wonder what that does over time. I think it's a really, really interesting question, particularly in involution. Um, we know it doesn't fully contribute because mice will still basically involute you know, when they're not getting any kind of stress or anything like that. So um, again, it's it's kind of an intrinsic process for some reason, uh, whether that's the same as the fat or not, we don't quite know, but I think um, I think there's a lot we could learn from those repeated sort of damage scenarios for sure. So is, is the involution the same in germ-free mice? Uh, that's a great question. It definitely occurs. Is it the same? I don't want to sort of split hairs and determine what the actual differences are, but but it definitely still occurs, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I'm seeing one more question in the talk. Um, it's, uh, is it correct to interpret that GR39 knockout results in elevated BMP4 at baseline? And if so, why do you think that might be? We don't have, we've just generated those. We haven't been able to do any experiments with them yet. So I, I, have, I can't answer that question directly whether GPR39 
knockout mice have. What we did was took um, endothelial cells uh, and knock those out. But yeah, I would suspect um, that GPR39 will have larger thymus as a baseline and, and throughout for some of these mechanisms. But this is, this is what we're trying to do at the moment. So hopefully soon we'll have an answer on that. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and end the seminar for today. That was an excellent discussion. Thanks for uh, joining us, Jared. That was a fantastic talk. And uh, the recording will be available uh, shortly. Thank you.